Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to be with you here uh, this morning, and hopefully we'll have a good talk and a very fruitful discussion afterwards. Um, so I was thinking about perhaps having around one hour for my talk, so I need to make it as uh, concise and possible in order to have uh, more time for discussion. Um, already you are familiar with the um, whole notion of interreligious um, or interfaith dialogue and relations and its importance. So I do not need to um, start explaining the importance of that. It has been commonplace to talk about um, many different complex realities leading to, to the uh, uh, particular situation we are in, which necessitates uh, interfaith relations. Um, very um, briefly, I perhaps uh, should refer to a couple of points in that context. One is um, the direct relations that politics and religion um, um, have had during the last at least um, 20 or so years after the um, um, end of Cold War and um, other important political developments in the last two or three uh, decades. Um, this is something I think quite unprecedented that we see uh, many um, interesting centers or institutes around the world, but perhaps most importantly in many Western countries, including the United States, the establishment of centers for religion and diplomacy. Um, I think this is something quite, um, at least at this level, um, unprecedented, and that um, indicates the importance of Switch the microphones. That uh, clearly indicates the close relationship between religion and politics in our today's world. And uh, when we talk about the relation between religion and politics, then we can uh, get a sense about the importance of religion in politics and hence the importance of interreligious, interfaith uh, dynamics. Um, the importance of culture is also, I think, something that has been um, emphasized by many scholars, particularly uh, Huntington um, in his um, theory of clash of civilizations or clash of cultures. Um, as far as I remember, when he was uh, propounding that view, he was also emphasizing the importance of dialogue. Although uh, perhaps it was in the Islamic world, uh, the initiative was taken by the, the then president of Iran, Hamad Khatami, who uh, proposed the idea of dialogue among civilizations, and I think the year 2001 was called after that idea. But I think Huntington himself was also referring to the importance of dialogue. So the main point in his theory was that the old kind of more political economic um, lines along which the polarization was taking place in the old uh, world was uh, being replaced by a new order in which uh, cultures would become much more important. And hence, uh, because religion is also a very important part of culture, we're talking about the importance of religions in the new world order and also um, consequently the importance of interfaith relations. Um, so when we talk about interfaith relations, obviously because Christianity and Islam constitute the two um, largest religious communities around the world, uh, perhaps we should be more practically focused on the uh, relationship between Christi uh, Christianity and Islam. Although the um, interfaith relations in terms of Jewish Muslim, Jewish Christian, and also Eastern religions, Hindu, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism are also very much relevant, but for different reasons perhaps we should be more limited to our talk on Christian-Muslim relationship uh, in the context of interfaith dialogue. 
Um, one important factor is that these are the two important regions around the world in terms of the population, and also that a lot of uh, this kind of um, rift between uh, so-called the West and the East also happens along, um, along the lines of the, the rift between Christianity and Islam. So these are um, very obvious facts that um, lead to the conclusion that, again, we need to be more focused on Christian-Muslim relations. So that's, that is going to be the heart of my discussion. I'm not going to talk about other aspects of interfaith dialogue. Um, some observations, that was part of uh, the title of my talk. So the observations are of two kinds, uh, historical ones and also later theological ones in terms of my conclusion. The uh, historical observations that I'm going to very briefly make um, are going to be focused on um, how Christians throughout the history of Christianity, obviously after the coming of Islam into being, have viewed uh, Islam. Um, and then very briefly about how Muslims have viewed other religions, particularly Christianity, and then the theological observation about how um, best to do um, this kind of interfaith relations uh, or how best to view it um, from a more Islamic theological point of view. So first, a historical observation which is mainly concentrated on how uh, Christianity has viewed Islam. Obviously, this is a very long story, at least as, as old as the um, um, as old as Islam from the very beginning when Islam came to being. Um, Christians have held um, views about Islam. Very generally speaking, um, there have been both bright spots and dark chapters in this very long um, book of relationship and Christian views of Islam, but I'm going to be more um, specifically talking about a couple of important figures and thinkers and streams of thought within Christianity uh, on how they have viewed Islam. Uh, the first, perhaps, um, thinker um, that we should talk about is John of Damascus, uh, who died in 750 um, CE, um, which was living at the time when the Umayyad uh, dynasty was ruling the Islamic world, Bani Umayyad. Um, he um, was mainly, his position was mainly polemical against Islam, but, and his main view about Islam was that it is, or it was in his view, a Christian heresy. That had both positive and negative uh, aspects to it. It was thought not to be that much alien from, from Christianity, therefore it was some, in, in, in some way a kind of Christian uh, thing, Christian phenomenon but at the same time a Christian heresy. So that was the negative aspect of it. Um, in comparison with many other um, parallel views in, in his time, that was, I think, generally a positive thing, although the emphasis on um, Islam being heretical was not obviously positive from an Islamic point of view. Um, this kind of polemics uh, continued for, for a while. Um, and I'm just jumping because of uh, the shorter time that I'm now being given. Um, then we have from 1096 the launch of the Crusades. I'm sure you are already familiar with the history, so I do not need to delve into it. But for almost two centuries, the Crusades continued eight main wars or uh, Crusades, um, which had also to do with the internal rift within Christianity in 1054, um, I think, we had the uh, schism uh, that um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity kind of separated itself from the dominant Roman um, Catholic tradition. So that also played its uh, significant role in terms of how the Crusades um, were later, um, later happened. So that could um, give us a sense about the general tendency of Christians in relation to Islam for, for many centuries, at least uh, from uh, 11 to 13 and 14. Um, 
this negative image continued at least until um, from 12th to 14th century. Uh, you could find a good and concise uh, history of that in uh, a book um, written by Norman Daniel, which is called Islam and the West. So it talks about mainly from 12th to 14th century all the um, negative views of Christians um, against uh, Islam. Um, so one of couple of references to, to these negative views, they, they were both negative in terms of how they perceived Islam in general and how they perceived uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, with respect to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, they, they were thinking, for example, um, that Muhammad was a cardinal who wanted to become a pope, and then because he didn't get elected, he um, kind of separated himself from the church, becoming a, a kind of heresy or uh, uh, rebellion against the, uh, the the church, or that, for example, he had trained. Um, uh, according to another story, he had trained. This is um, what Daniel says in in his book that um, Muhammad had trained a dove or something like that, a bird that would sit on his shoulder, so um, trying to. Um, deceive or delude his companions or his followers into thinking that he was in that way kind of uh, inspired or influenced by, by, by the higher order. Then um, still in that period of history, uh, the, one of the darkest uh, story against Islam and, and particularly the Prophet Muhammad is Dante's um, com um, divine comedy, particularly the Inferno where he talks about a uh, prophet being mutilated and languishing in the depth of hell, which is a very, uh, very dark image. <clears throat> uh, in the 12th century, interestingly, we have the translation of the Quran into Latin language by Peter the Venerable. But the interesting thing is that that was uh, a kind of reaction um, that took place. For example, uh, very prominent Christian uh, scholar and, and uh, mystic uh, Bernard of Clairvaux um, was criticizing Peter and in his response he said that in order to deal with Christian heresy, still continuing the image of Christian heresy about Islam, we need to know what Islam is and in particular what the main authoritative source of this Islam the Quran is in order to be able to respond to it effectively. So that was the main reason for the translation of the Quran in, in the 12th century. Um, on a positive note, when we come to um, 12th century, 12th, 13th century, we come across uh, Francis of Assisi, who visited Egypt, and he was uh, deeply impressed by the Muslim call to prayer in, in that uh, country, which encouraged, in, encouraged him, uh, influenced him, and he encouraged the friars to um, to announce worship service with uh, church, um, by, by church bells and perhaps other, other things, other means. So he was highly influenced and impressed by the call to prayer. Um, a very interesting figure comes along in the 15th century, um, Nicholas of Cusa. Um, he has a very interesting book, um, Dofasa Fidei, the title of the book, um, translated into English as Concerning the Harmony of the Faiths. He talks about an imaginary uh, kind of dialogue between, I think, 17 people representing different religions and different denominations within different religions. And um, the main thing is that, in his understanding, there is a fundamental unity despite many differences, uh, mostly in terms of how different religious traditions worship and pray to God, but there is a fundamental unity among those 17 representatives in the, uh, in the story that he tells in that book. Um, and the interesting word that he uses in, uh, as, as his, his own conclusion is that it is the words, not swords, that uh, should be the main means of response uh, among different uh, adherents of different religious traditions. Um, he also wrote a book on, on the Quran, um, 
Sibratu al Qurani, sifting of the Quran, which um, was both negative and positive again, but um, generally Nicholas is a very um, interesting figure. I think uh, perhaps more studied, uh, more studies should be done on um, the way he thought about uh, various religions in, and in particular Islam. This uh, very positive spirit was very, unfortunately, very much short-lived. And um, the kind of animosity towards Islam uh, also, again, um, was deepened, uh, especially because of the threats of the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Turks. So uh, the Ottoman Empire and the fall of Constantinople, Constantinople in uh, 15th century, 1453. Um, so that was also very much uh, influencing, for example, in the uh, 15th, 16th century, um, very prominent Christian figure, Martin Luther, who was um, mainly, I think, negatively influenced um, by the uh, threats of the Ottoman Turk. And he talks about it in, in his own book, On War Against the Turk. That's the title of his book. And I have a quote from him there uh, in, in that book. He was thinking about uh, the Turks as, um, as evil because their god was evil and they were the servants of the devil. So he says that he, referring to Muhammad, greatly praises, and I quote from him from that book uh, on war against the Turk. He, Muhammad, greatly praises Christ and Mary as being the only ones without sin, and yet he believes nothing more of Christ than that he is a holy prophet, like Jeremiah or Jonah, and denies that he is God's son and true God. On the other hand, Muhammad highly exalts and praises himself and boasts that he has talked with God and the angels. From this, anyone can easily see that Muhammad is a destroyer of our Lord Christ and his kingdom. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, baptism, the sacrament, gospel, faith, and all Christian doctrine are gone. And instead of Christ, only Muhammad and his doctrine of works, and especially of the sword, is left. This very negative image of Islam, and in particular Muhammad, peace be upon him, continued uh, and actually pervaded um, until uh, 19th century. So uh, we could very quickly uh, make a, a leap here and come to the 19th and then 20th century. Um, three major developments took place in the 19th century, um, leading to um, a more positive approach to generally other faith, including Islam. One was the improvement of uh, transport, transportation, communication, which led to uh, migration, awareness of religious diversity, the other one, very interesting, the rise of the discipline of the academic study of religion, religion Wissenschaft, as they call it in Germany, um, uh, the, the original context uh, where this whole thing came to being, particularly Max Muller, the perhaps founder of uh, this scientific study of religion. Um, in particular, for example, in 1840, Thomas Carlyle wrote a book on heroes, and there he admired the prophet as a sincere and devout person. The third development was missionaries that um, put um, Christians in personal contact with Muslims. Um, they went to different countries, including Muslim, uh, the, the Muslim world, and they came into contact with personally with Muslims, which had its own far-reaching implications for their understanding of other faith, including Islam. In 1959, um, I have a quote from uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith, a great historian of religion and also an Islamic Islamicist, who said that the traditional form of Western scholarship in the study of other men's religion was that of an impersonal presentation of an it. So another religion was just an it, object of study in that way. The first great innovation in recent times has been the personalization of the faith observed so that one finds a discussion of a they. So it becomes they. Presently, the observer becomes personally involved so that the situation is one of a we talking about a they. 
The next step is a dialogue where we talk to you. If there is a listening and, and uh, mutuality, this way um, uh, became that we talk with you, or becomes we talk with you. The culmination of the process is when we all are talking with each other about us. So he's kind of indicating uh, a new situation that was arising, that we find so much commonalities and we find that despite the differences among religions, we are um, the same and we, are, we all talk about us. So the whole history of religions is not that we are Muslim, you are Christian, and so on and so forth. We are just people thinking about our religions in, in, in a kind of collective way. Um, 1893, we have the establishment of the Board Parliament of Religions uh, in, in, uh, in the United States, um, in Chicago, I think. In 1910 and uh, 1928, the uh, first and second World Missionary Conference took place in Edinburgh and Jerusalem, and there was also huge development and um, advance in terms of how Christianity looked at other religious traditions. Um, one interesting quote from Hendrik Kramer, a great um, Christian theologian, about this whole development and improvement was what he calls the unequivocal disavowal at Jerusalem of all spiritual imperialism is one of the clearest symptoms of this change. So within 18 years, from 1910 to 1928, you could see in his own writings, Hendrik Kramer, Christian theologian, this. Um, this disavowal from, from um, imper spiritual imperialism, which would think of other religions as, as um, uh, enormously inferior to Christianity. Um, in 1948, we have the establishment of the World Council of Churches, a very interesting uh, Christian um, uh, institution. Um, which is mainly representative of Protestant and also Eastern Orthodox Christianity, but also in many events that they um, they hold, they have been holding uh, since that time. They also inc uh, include people from other faiths, uh, Catholic Christians, and also Muslims. I have participated in a couple of conferences uh, held by WCC in, in Geneva and other places, uh, and these uh, attempts have continued since 1950 until now. And I think this is one of the most fruitful um, dialogue contexts uh, that uh, one can see in the world. Uh, interestingly, in 1965, I'm sure all of you are familiar in one, one way or another with the uh, document that was, um, that was presented by the um, Catholic Church, by the Vatican, the Second uh, Vatican Council, uh, called Nostra Aetate. So the de declaration has a lot of uh, positive things about all religions, but in particular about Islam. Um, I have um, had the uh, document here, and um, I can later quote one part of it, which has uh, a specific thing about, specifically positive things about Islam. So again, I would skip that because of time limit. Uh, the way I understand that particular document is that the, that, was, that indicated a huge shift from exclusivism to what we call inclusivism. So a more positive uh, view about all religions, including Islam. That was the highlight of, of that document in 1965. Um, further on, uh, on the road, Christian thinkers have formulated other views according to which um, they could have, they have been able to um, think about other religions, including Islam, in a more positive way. Um, these are mostly, I would, I would say, kind of fragmentary thinkers in, in Christianity. They, they do not represent a whole uh, stream of thought within Christianity. But many thinkers, like, for example, uh, John Hick, uh, Paul Nieter, and others who hold a kind of pluralistic views of other religions, including Islam. But that um, Vatican Council doc document, I think, was highly influenced by Karl Rahner, a Christian theologian who is the most important representative of Christian inclusivism. Um, how much time do we have? 10 minutes? 15 minutes, OK. Um, so very 
quickly, I think um, you could see that throughout all these uh, steps of developments within Christianity as they viewed other religions and in particular Islam. They shifted from exclusivism towards inclusivism and in a kind of less systematic way towards uh, what we call pluralism. On the other hand, the views that Muslims have held with respect to other religions, including Christianity, I think could be seen as following the same, more or less the same pattern. Um, very generally, hopefully we will have more time in Q&A um, part of our talk today to talk about the Quran. Generally speaking, one could discern both positive and negative um, verses in the Quran in relation to others, in particular Christians. I will talk about it later. But our theologians have also held um, these views, mostly exclusivist views, thinking that, that the only true religion is Islam, mostly inspired by uh, such verses as وَمَنْ يَبْتَغَ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ or um, um, the other verse which also talks about Islam being the only religion accepted by God. Um, in the din and the Islam, I'm sure you are already familiar with these verses. So, uh, for example, in Azari's Faisal uh, al-Tafraqa bayn al-Islam wa zandaqa, also, although he's mainly concerned with kind of internal divisions within Islam, Sunni, Shia, and Sufi, and other um, internal divisions and categories within Islam, but he also indirectly talks about how Islam should view other religions, including Christians and Jews. And although there are positive aspects to his thought, he uh, generally holds a negative um, negative view about other religions. Ibn Taymiyyah's views are also very much uh, well known about how he, how he thinks about other religions, including Christians. I'm not going to take time. I'm sure you are already familiar with that. So generally speaking, the, the views that most Muslim uh, scholars have, um, have expressed with uh, respect to Chris Christianity I think has been uh, negatively um, and, and mainly formulated in the language of polemics against Christianity. Main charges that um, are talked about by Muslim scholars are um, that the Christians have altered uh, their scripture, they have forged parts of the revelation, they have held seriously errant doctrines like, for example, origin of sin, incarnation, the Trinity, and also less important, but at the same time, I think significant, for example, significantly they think that uh, some parts of, of uh, the New Testament uh, inspires Christians to be submissive. For example, the story of the other chick, or um, separation between religion and the state. Um, uh, for example, the, in Mark 12, 17, where uh, the Bible talks about uh, giving to Caesar what is due to Caesar and giving to God what is due to God. And so this has um, uh, been thought to uh, lead to the separation of church and state, which is not acceptable to, according to many Muslim scholars, and that's, that also constitutes another, another errant doctrine or view among Christians. In uh, parentheses, um, interestingly, I was looking at a Shiite book in um, fifth century Islamic calendar written by um, the, the book called Tuhaf al uh written by, uh, actually compiled by a Shia scholar, Ibn Shu'abi Harani, who um, collects in that book um, sayings attributed to the Prophet and to the Shiite Imam, but at the end he brings a couple of uh, supplications and also sayings attributed to, I think, as far as I remember, to the prophets David, Moses, and Jesus. And in, in the part where he talks about the supplications or sayings attributed to, to Jesus, he actually brings those two problematic parts, the other chick, and also the um, Caesars and God's due and whatever. And, with, and he quotes them very approvingly. He doesn't uh, bring any footnote or any annotation, whatever to criticize those kind of things. And these are his own, uh, I mean, the words in the, in the book. The same thing that you would come across in, in, in the Bible. Generally, uh, the problems with the views that majority of Muslims have held with respect to Christianity is that they fail to consider the nuances of many Christian doctrines, including the Trinity. 
uh, many different attempts that Christian scholars have made in order to um, explain what the Trinity um, means to them and different kinds of tendencies among Christianity and the general the general um, tendency among them which tries to somehow actually st still maintain um, the view that uh, whatever view they have about the Trinity does not compromise on the unity of God. So they still think of themselves as monotheists and um, worshipping and praying to one God. <coughs> Um, obviously, Christianity has a it stands in a kind of more difficult situation because um, because it it thinks about the finality of God's redemptive uh, action in Jesus Christ, and therefore anything coming after Christianity, including Islam, um, would be problematic. But even if you hold a very negative view as a Muslim scholar against Christianity in relation to Christianity, one could not really fail to see many positive refer references to, to Christians in the world. Interestingly, these uh, uh, verses are closely studied by a Christian um, scholar. I'm sure at least some of you are familiar with the book, Quranic Christians by Jane uh, Damon McAuliffe, which is a wonderful study. But interestingly, when you read that book, um, and the book deals with positive uh, references to Christians in the Quran. The general outcome of, uh, of the book, or uh, conclusion of the book, is that despite the positive, apparently positive references to Christians in the Quran, I think 10 um, exegetes or commentators, Muslim commentators, that she has uh, selected for her work from both uh, Shi and Sunni tradition, and both Muqtazili and uh, Ash'ari traditions, Generally, they tend to agree that those positive references do not re are not really positive references. So her conclusion is that um, one really wonders um, what those um, Quranic verses uh, about what kind of Christianity they those Quranic verses talk about, because generally the, the view of shared by all these scholars, she Sunni Ashari Muhtazili, is that those who happen to embrace Islam are the reference of those verses. And those constitute very, very few people like uh, Negus or um, his, and his people and uh, Salman al-Farsi or um, uh, perhaps a few other people. And one would wonder why there are so many references to, uh, positive references to Christians in the Quran. And then um, the instances of those positive references are quite few uh, in the understand, understanding of those Muslim commentators. Um, a recent development was what happened in 2007, a common word initiation or initiative by Muslim scholars, first perhaps signed by 138 or 37 Muslim scholars later. I think now it, it is signed by more than 400 Muslim scholars around the world. Uh, that's a very interesting, I think, initiative which, which should be followed and uh, further. Now I would come to the concluding part of my talk, which is more kind of uh, theological after this very brief historical um, view uh, on both sides. Um, I think that we need to go beyond exclusivism and inclusivism. Exclusivism does not hold um, very obviously because um, one really wonders how one can convincingly argue that we as Muslim happen to hold all the truth and the adherents of all other religions just believe in false doctrines and errant doctrines. That is not even compatible with, with the Quran. That is quite, I think, obvious. I don't think um, there are many Muslim scholars who genuinely think that the only true religion it should be or could be Islam and all other religions are false. So perhaps the more dominant model uh, of interfaith dialogue or interfaith relations in the Islamic world, as is the case with the Christian world, is inclusivism. One um, Shiite representative of this inclusivism, although it has been thought by some as somehow being pluralist, I think is uh, Mutahari in, in recent history of Iran. A prominent Shia scholar, uh, theologian of, of Iran, 
uh, who wrote many books, and in, in one of his books, his, his talk, he talks about the um, question of religious diversity, and particularly talks about the question of the salvation of non-Muslims. And he makes an interesting distinction between Qasr and Muqasr, those who are incapable, Qasr, and those who are negligent, Muqasr. And he thinks that um, he draws on uh, the kind of already established um, thought in the Islamic um, jurisprudential text and perhaps theological text with respect to those who, to whom the, the message of Islam did not reach. Or those who are, for example, um, um, insane people, or those who um, did not reach the age of puberty and they just died. So the Muslim theologians and scholars had already talked about this. And they said that these were incapable of reaching the truth. And therefore, uh, God's mercy would be also extended to them. And they, they could have a good, uh, positive share of salvation in the hereafter. So he extends that notion of some people being incapable uh, in contrast with those who are negligent. And he extends that to the majority of Christians and perhaps adherents of other traditions to whom the truth of Islam, for whom the truth of Islam has not been established. Therefore, he thinks of them as incapable of reaching the truth of Islam. Therefore, some kind of salvation would be extended to them. And um, a Christian convert to Islam who has been living in Iran for 30 years or so has written a book on Mutahari's view, Islam and religious pluralism, um, Dr. Muhammad Degenhausen. And he maintains the view that Mutahari's view represents a kind of pluralism that even prefers it to pluralism, um, pl pluralistic views uh, represented by people like John Hick. I totally disagree with, with the thesis of the book and think uh, that still Mutahari's view and Degenhausen's view, these are still along the inclusivist uh, lines of thought. They do not represent a pluralistic view, and they should not be preferred to views um, represented by John Hick and others. What this view, uh, the distinction between Qasr and Mughassar leads to, uh, to me, is, is still a kind of inclusivist view, which um, thinks of others as one view or another in a kind of indirect way, implicit way, still uh, inferior to Muslims. And this really doesn't do the job. Um, besides many questions and complexities that would arise with respect to the distinction between negligent people, Mughassar, and incapable Qasr, and, and, and so on. Um, how could really, uh, how could we understand that the majority of Christians are incapable, incapable of reaching the truth? So th there must be something wrong with uh, with them that they have not been able to reach the truth of Islam. So it, it, it's, it's really a very kind of ad hoc view about the majority of Christians. It's not just, a few. unless if you think that this extension applies to a few Christians, then still we are kind of um, within the paradigm of um, even exclusivism, even not into inclusive, inclusivism yet. For different uh, reasons, I think pluralism is the best way um, out, out of this whole question of religious diversity. Um, there are two main things that I have already done, but I think uh, different scholars should also um, expand uh, on that and contribute in different ways from Quranic uh, perspective, from theological perspective, philosophical perspective. Uh, one thing is the emphasis in the Quran on um, Islam as being as meaning submission to God rather than referring specifically to the historical religion that um, came into being after the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Very clearly, when you uh, study those verses of the Quran where there is a talk about the ones that I earlier mentioned, in Islam or Islam The clear context of the preceding verses and following verses very clearly shows that the kind of Islam that the Quran talks about in those two contexts is the general submission to God. And it is not limited and should not be limited to Muslims. That's one thing. 
The other thing that I have recently talked about in another context was the issue of Ahlul Kitab. If you closely study the um, verses of the Quran related to Ahlul Kitab, I think there, is a, there should be a clear understanding, as I argued in, in my lecture, that the Quran makes a clear differentiation between, uh, and this is the kind of refrain in the Quran, min al utul kitab, or min al in al-ladhina kafaru min ahl al-kitab, or min al-ladhina utul kitab, and so on and so forth. So there is a clear discrimination, min, min tar'idiyya in, in Arabic. So there are among the, uh, the Christians or the Jews those who are such and such. So there is a clear distinction, and which establishes to me that in the Quran, we are not talking about an inherent, essential kind of wholesale rejection of Christianity and Judaism or other traditions. The, uh, the rejection of the Quran, the negative attitude of the Quran, has to do with the sins that they were committing, and uh, many other things, in particular in their practice, rather than in their theological doctrines or other things. So this, this also should be, I think, very significantly taken into consideration. So these are two uh, um, things that comes to my mind, two things that come to my mind that would help us formulate a more pluralistic, pluralistic understanding of other faiths, including Christians. And um, I think that's, that's the kind of thing that Muslim scholars should do in order to uh, see the whole question of religious diversity in a better light and try to formulate a better understanding of interfaith dialogue and hopefully practically um, um, practice a better um, way of relating to adherents of other religious traditions, including Christians. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.